International News Now. All right, so we want to start today with a video from my favorite newscast, apparently, PBS NewsHour. It's a solid broadcast. It is. It is. It is. I feel always a little bad because I keep going there, but whatever. Uh, now, this clip summarizes an ongoing standoff between the Texas National Guard and federal border agents over access and control of Shelby Park in Eagle Pass, Texas. And so let's uh, go ahead and run that clip now. A standoff between federal border patrol and Texas state officials is intensifying following a Supreme Court ruling in favor of the Biden administration. Laura Barron Lopez has more. Earlier this week, the Supreme Court said U.S. Border Patrol agents could remove razor wire that the state put in place along the Rio Grande River. The Homeland Security Department is demanding immediate access to a section of the border being blocked with razor wire and fencing. But Texas Governor Greg Abbott is doubling down, blocking the agents from entering the area and saying Texas's constitutional, constitutional authority is, quote, the supreme law of the land and supersedes any federal statutes to the contrary. Joining me to discuss this further is Stephen Vladek, a professor at the University of Texas School of Law. Professor Vladek, thanks so much for joining. Uh, Republican Governor Abbott is saying Texas is going to hold the line, and it's unclear when or if this razor wire is going to be removed. Who ultimately has the authority over the border here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear under the Constitution, under our precedents, that immigration policy control of the border really is ultimately in the federal government's purview. But Laura, I think it's just as clear that Governor Abbott wants this confrontation and that he's willing to take this battle all the way back to the Supreme Court before he's going to stand down. And Governor Abbott is claiming that he has this authority under the U.S. Constitution because the federal government isn't protecting Texas against a, quote, invasion. That's the way he's been describing it. Is this a reasonable interpretation of the Constitution? No, and in two different respects. I mean, the first is that obviously, you know, an influx of asylum seekers, however many we're talking about, is not what the founders had in mind when they used the word invasion. But Laura, second, even if you're not persuaded by that, the clause Governor Abbott's relying on in Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution was dealing with the specific scenario of the ability of states to respond to invasions until federal authorities were able to respond. This is a time in American history when the federal military was small. It was very spread out. It took weeks to travel. Congress was usually out of session. There's no support in our history. There's no support in founding era materials for the idea that states can decide for themselves that they're under invasion. And even if the federal government disagrees, that somehow it's the state's determination that would control. All right. Let's cover a few points here. Um, first, as the clip points out, this is a political conflict that has uh, political you know, motivations. As he said, Governor Greg Abbott has, has wants this conflict. He wants to continue this conflict. And he has long um, used this issue. Right, He has criticized the Biden administration from um, the very first for failing to control the number of illegal entrants coming across the Mexican border into Texas. And he's used border security as perhaps his primary issue as governor. So this latest conflict is really um, part of a series of battles over border security with Democrats that um, he's waged uh, various levels of government. And so he takes on the Biden administration, but also, as you may know, he's um, trucked busloads of migrants out of Texas into uh, other states and into cities like New York City to make a point about sharing the burden of, of integrating uh, internet uh, illegal migrants coming into the United States. And so um, what I want to concentrate on here is the conflict itself by looking at the timeline of events first and foremost. So what happened? In January 2024, so just about two months ago, uh, Texas National Guard uh, closed Shelby Park in Eagle Pass and blocked U.S. border agents from the area. 
and they argued that the border, um, the Biden administration had failed to prevent Ill illegal crossings there, and so they sort of said that it was effectively another point of entry that um, it was forced to um, shut down because the national government wouldn't. And then a couple of weeks later, the U.S. Supreme Court issued an, an order to vacate what was already an injunction that was in place from a different court that prevented U.S. Uh, border agents from cutting away razor wire erected by the Texas National Guard. And uh, this was important because the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision sided with the federal government here and its authority over immigration rather than the state of Texas. And Chief Justice John Roberts and uh, Amy Coney Barrett joined the court's three liberal justices in issuing this order. So the Supreme Court weighs in. It says that if there's a conflict between the federal government and the state of Texas, the federal government gets to do um, uh, what it wants in cutting this razor wire. However, this order to vacate the injunction preventing U.S. border agents from cutting razor wire was concerned about an earlier conflict between the U.S. border agents and the Texas National Guard, not exactly this conflict over access to Shelby Park, and so that isn't really resolved by this decision. So after the ruling, Governor Greg Abbott responded that Texas would continue to control Selby Park. However, following a tragic drowning at the site, the National Guard, the Texas National Guard, has given Border Patrol um, access to the boat ramp in the park, but um, under very strict conditions. They have to give their names and the time they entered the park is recorded. And, and uh, according to the Texas Tribune, the control is still uh, in the hands of the Texas National Guard. So, of course, as often happens, uh, members of both political parties started to take sides. And so 24 out of 25 Republican governors supported Texas. Can you guess what state did not? You can't, can you? No, I can't. Vermont. Vermont. <laughs> it's always Vermont. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they uh, supported Governor Abbott in Texas, 24 out of 25. Uh, some of them pledged to send members of their own state's National Guard um, to Texas to help with enforcement. And um, so the crisis sort of enlarges, right? On the other side, some Democrats, notably Democratic uh, Texas members of the House of Representatives, Joaquin Castro and Greg Cesar, uh, they called on U.S. President Joe Biden to established federal control over the Texas National Guard. And they drew this historical parallel to uh, actions by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, who federalized Texas, I mean, not Texas, Alabama National Guard forces during the battle over uh, school desegregation. And so both sides so far haven't done um, anything really to escalate it past this sort of standoff. Um, but there is this uh, threat, at least, or a possibility that there could be some sort of armed conflict between a state's National Guard and U.S. border agents. That would be really bad. So let's now discuss the constitutional implications of this conflict between the state of Texas and the federal government over immigration. We're going to start with another clip from the PBS NewsHour. So let's go ahead and roll that one now. What are the larger implications of this standoff between Texas and the federal government? I mean, the larger implications are pretty staggering. It's not just the specter of a physical confrontation between federal and Texas officials along the border in Eagle Pass. It's also basically a relitigation of a debate that we had in American law for the first 70 years of this country about the ability of states to effectively nullify those federal laws that they disagreed with, that they thought were unconstitutional. For better or for worse in our constitutional system, federal law supersedes state law, even when we don't like how the federal government is or is not enforcing those federal laws. The remedies for those disagreements are not to allow every state to go out on their own and to have their own policies. The remedies, if you really have a problem with the policies, is to change the people who are making them. Otherwise, it's a federal system, Laura, in name only. 
And Governor Abbott also claims that the federal government has, quote, broken the compact with states. Um, where ha what, what do you think he means by that? And have states in the past used that language to justify defying the federal government? Yeah, I mean, the compact theory of the Constitution is a pretty outlier view, especially these days, about the, the way the Constitution was formed. The basic premise is that the federal government, the constitutional system we have, was formed by the states, and therefore the states can control its terms. That was the argument on which the southern states predicated secession um, and helped to precipitate the Civil War. There's a reason why we tend not to hear that much of it these days. Again, I mean, I think there's a lot of folks who are going to have strong views about whether the Biden administration is or isn't doing what's best for the country at the border. But the way to air those disagreements is through the federal electoral process. In a world in which states can follow this version of the compact theory as a justification for interfering with federal authority, what's to stop California from doing that? to the next Republican president, mm -hmm. what's to stop Vermont from doing that to the next Republican president? And then we're talking about a system in which the states have all the power and the federal government is basically impotent to do anything. All right, let me say a few things here. First, the constitutional and legal precedent favors the federal government's authority on immigration over that of the states. In the legal battle between Texas and the federal government, the Biden administration argues that immigration enforcement is the domain of the federal government. The Supreme Court has affirmed the federal government's ultimate authority over immigration in a case from 2012, United States versus Arizona. In a 5-3 decision, the Supreme Court ruled that states could not implement their own immigration laws. The state of Texas has argued that its actions are justified on constitutional grounds. They say that Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution allows states to conduct foreign policy and engage in war without consent of Congress if they are actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Governor Abbott's position is that the flow of migrants across the Texas border represents an invasion and thus justifies its actions on immigration. As the clip points out, most legal scholars do not agree with Texas that a wave of migrants entering the country constitutes an actual military invasion. So far, U.S. courts have agreed. Three courts of appeal rejected similar arguments by officials in New York, New Jersey, and California in the late 1990s that a rise in unauthorized border arrivals qualified as an invasion for constitutional purposes. However, the legal battle surrounding this issue may return to the Supreme Court, which now has a more conservative majority that may see things differently. A new Texas law, Senate Bill 4, would allow state and local police officers to arrest migrants who cross the border from Mexico illegally. The law was set to go into effect on March 5th of this year, but was blocked in federal courts this week. Many believe this case will ultimately be decided by the Supreme Court because the Texas law directly challenges what has historically been seen as the federal government's exclusive role in arresting, detaining, and deporting migrants who are in the country without authorization. So stay tuned. Ultimately, this conflict has larger implications for constitutional balance of power between federal governments and the states in general. These state challenges to federal migration laws also directly conflict with the supremacy clause of the Constitution that places federal authority over that of the individual states. As the UT law professor from the clip argues, if Texas is allowed to take over parts of immigration policy over the wishes of the federal government, other states may defy federal law on immigration or other issues. Yeah, so this could be a real problem. Hopefully, both sides will sort of stand down. That's still kind of my <laughs> ultimate suggestion. Anyway, let's move on uh, to the other newsmaking uh, event here in Texas, the dueling visits by uh, Biden and Trump at the southern border. So now we have a clip from ABC News to get us started on this topic, so let's roll that now. Migrant crisis at the top of voters' concerns in this election year, President Biden and former President Trump are making dueling visits to the southern border. 
Biden is expected to meet with Border Patrol agents and local leaders in Texas, where he'll defend a bipartisan border security deal killed by House Republicans this month. The bill called for hiring more officers and immigration judges and would have expedited work permits for migrants. It took four months, four months of us, the White House, working uh, with Republicans and Democrats in the Senate to get that done. And obviously, uh, Republicans have rejected that because of politics. Trump says the bipartisan deal wasn't strong enough to secure the border. He's promising, if elected, to begin mass deportations of migrants. It comes as communities across the country struggle to house the historic influx of migrants. Denver's mayor just yesterday said he needs to close four shelters and scale back services due to budget concerns. This allows us to deliver people high quality, dignified services and also reduce the amount of costs we spend, make sure they're successful and the city successful. And we think that's a path forward that Denver should be proud of. New York's mayor now calling for changes to the city's sanctuary city policy. Just this week, more than 70 migrants were found living in this basement of a furniture store. And in Georgia, outrage after a college student was brutally murdered during her morning jog, allegedly by an undocumented immigrant previously arrested but released. Lakin's death is a direct result of failed policies on the federal level and an unwillingness by this White House to secure the southern border. The president is considering executive action to address the migrant crisis, including tougher asylum laws, but the White House says no such announcement will come today. That announcement could come at next week's State of the Union, but the White House insists any real solution for the border crisis needs to come from Congress. Okay, so Biden and Trump visit the border on the very same day. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. <laughs> you know? I mean, Biden in one of his uh, appearances says, well, it just so happens that Trump's visiting the border the same day. And I'm like, yeah, just so happens. <laughs> and so anyway, this dual split screen event, right, is a bit of electoral um, posturing. And a bit. A bit, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to be very... <laughs> Diplomatic? <laughs> Diplomatic. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I shouldn't call. <laughs> right. Anyway, but it does highlight that both parties now see immigration as the electoral issue. I think that this won't necessarily go away. Now a lot of things change, right? And so, um, but uh, it's clear that, and this is what's really important about immigration as an electoral issue, I would say, is that both sides now have strategized that perhaps they could use this issue as a um, winner in to to sway certain persuadable voters to their side um, rather than the issue being an advantage for just one side or the other. And so um, typically the immigration issue um, has been a Republican issue that Democrats have tried to avoid, um, especially uh, over the last uh, few years. However, now Democrats are, are, are changing attack, uh, their tactics a little bit and trying to um, showcase their problem-solving um, approach toward uh, the crisis at the border. And so, so how are they trying to do that? Well, the Democrats are making an argument, and, and Biden did this at um, his border appearance uh, yesterday. Uh, they argue that it's the Republicans that are hindering um, action on the border to solve the current crisis because Republicans rejected the recent deal uh, brokered by uh, in the Senate on border security that would have allowed um, President Biden to take uh, uh, dramatic action to halt the flow of migrants across the border. And so Democrat, and, and we're gonna talk a bit more about this later in uh, uh, this broadcast. Uh, there's a real, uh, a broader uh, strategy that's sort of emerging as Democrats, um, particularly in more moderate districts, are going to try to uh, persuade themselves as a pragmatic problem solver on border security issues and that the Republicans are the ones that are hindering any progress. And so they're trying to lay blame on the Republicans for that crucial thing that we covered in a previous INN, um, the uh, failure of the, of the uh, deal that linked uh, aid to Ukraine with border security that fell apart after uh, 
former President Trump uh, uh, came out against it, right? And so that's the Democrat side. The Republicans have a pretty standard playbook, and, and I think they're playing it uh, the same way. Republicans fault the person in charge for the crisis that emerged under Biden's watch. And so they fault President Biden for chaos at the border. Um, they argue that uh, even without that um, deal uh, that failed in the Senate, President Biden could take actions to um, help address uh, the border crisis and hasn't and, and, and isn't. And in addition, uh, especially President Trump is promising much tougher action uh, than anything that was included in that uh, deal uh, if he would become uh, president and have a second term. And so that's how the strategies are laying out. Now, one thing to uh, also address here is how immigration has emerged as the leading issue. Polls show that immigration um, has uh, become the uh, most important problem facing the United States according to respondents. And so Gallup asked this recurring question and um, mentions of immigration as a problem um, facing the United States has um, been in this poll for um, decades, right, since 1981. Uh, the 28% that currently name immigration as the most important problem uh, in the United States essentially ties the previous record of 27% uh, that came in July 2019, uh, which, what, that, which it was um, a peak in uh, border crossings under the Trump administration that had um, some controversies regarding some of his policies, especially um, child separations from families um, at the time. And so, so this is a peak, right? Now, it should be noted that Republicans in, um, among these respondents in this poll are largely, largely responsible for uh, the increase because there was sort of a, a, a big increase from um, January to February in the number of people who mentioned immigration as the top um, problem. 57% of Republicans um, said this, and that's up from 37% just an, a month earlier. Um, independence showed some increase of concern about immigration. 16% uh, said it was the most important problem in January, now 22% say it is. But Democrats um, saw no meaningful change um, on uh, noting immigration as the, most, uh, as the biggest problem. Uh, only 9% of Democrats said it was in January and only 10% say it is in February. So there is a partisan difference. The real problem for Democrats is that President Biden is polling very badly on immigration and continues to do so. And so according to an ABC News uh, poll from mid-January of this year, only 18% approved of his handling of immigration um, and the border and 63% disapproved. Now this is the lowest rating on any president uh, on immigration since the uh, poll started um, asking this particular question in January 20, 2004, so for um, 24, 20 years. Um, a February 2024, I did a little polling research if you can't uh, tell, showed it a little bit better. And so, you know, you do have to take all these polls with a grain of salt because um, they, they, they range um, between different polling agencies, how they ask the question, et cetera. A Gallup poll from uh, this month said Biden had 28% approval, which is higher, right? And 67% disapproval, but still really terrible numbers. Now, just like the previous um, question about the importance of immigration as a problem, there's uh, a huge partisan difference um, on job approval of Biden when it comes to uh, handling immigration. Uh, almost all Republican voters, 93% um, disapproved of uh, Biden's handling on immigration. 
um, while 31% uh, of Democrats disapproved, so that's a huge difference. And over a majority of Democrats, 58%, said they approved of how Biden has handled uh, the border, and only 4% uh, of Republicans approved. And so, so really, um, while immigration, at least from my perspective, while immigration is this really um, important and uh, volatile issue right now, it's still not going to uh, persuade a lot of people who have uh, decided already their preferences, right? And, and so there, but there is this small uh, area in the middle that it could, in a very close election, that's going to make a big difference. So now we're going to move to a brief comparison of the general trends surrounding immigration across the southern border from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. So let's go ahead and show that slide. The, the two graphs shown on this slide encapsulate the heart of the crisis on the border. In short, illegal crossings over the southern border have risen dramatically under the Biden administration. The number of people taken into custody by the Border Patrol reached the highest levels ever under Biden, averaging two million per year. During the first days of the Biden administration, the president announced he would not use the Title 40, 42 policy to turn back unaccompanied minors who arrive without a parent or guardian. The numbers of teens and children began to shoot up almost immediately and continue to arrive at near record numbers. The same is true for families and single adults who have been arriving in historic numbers as well. Under Biden, the origin country of migrants also changed. Beginning in 2021, more migrants from other countries outside Mexico and Central America began to arrive at the U.S. southern border. In 2019, the year with the highest number of border crossings during the Trump administration, about 80% of migrants were from Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. In 2023, those three countries accounted for fewer than half of all border crossings. Commentators have pointed to several non-policy factors that are beyond the control of any government as partially responsible for the unprecedented levels of migration into the United States over the flat last few years, including the end of COVID restrictions, push factors of political and economic instability, particularly in Latin American countries such as Venezuela, and the pull factor of a robust American economy relative to the world that creates and has been creating lots of job opportunities for the mobile labor force around the world. And high wages. Yes. Okay, so while broader social, economic, and political factors help to partly explain the significantly higher levels of illegal crossings under Biden, there are also some policy reasons underlying these uh, patterns too. So let's talk about that. So as already mentioned, at the beginning of his term, President Biden signaled policy changes um, relative to the Trump administration. Uh, these included fewer restrictions on unaccompanied minors entering the country, uh, and, though, and that raised expectations that U.S. policy at the border would be more permissive than under uh, the Trump administration. The uh, Biden administration also in, uh, initiated other policy changes that resulted in more migrants entering the United States and fewer migrants who were in the United States being uh, deported or expelled. For example, Biden used immigration parole more extensively than the Trump administration. Humanitarian immigration parole is an executive power that allows the government to temporarily accept migrants from specific countries who don't qualify for a visa. And under Biden, humanitarian parole allowed hundreds of thousands of people from countries like Afghanistan, especially after the United States pulled out of that country, its military out of that country, Ukraine fighting uh, against Russia, uh, in a war that's important to U.S. foreign policy, Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, among other countries. Now, as shown um, in the top graph of the slide here, by 2023, Biden used parole uh, to allow nearly five times as many uh, migrants into the country as the Trump administration did. So that had an impact. 
At the same time, the Biden administration also did not expel um, as many uh, migrants who entered the United States illegally at the, um, when compared to the uh, Trump administration. On Biden's first day in office, he ordered a pause on most arrests and deportations. He also issued new guidelines to prioritize national security threats, um, um, serious and violent criminal apprehensions, and recent border crossers um, in terms of uh, for uh, deportation rather uh, than uh, those who have been um, not convicted of any crimes, not a serious uh, national security threat, and have been in the country uh, for a longer time. Now, as a result, uh, deportations of migrants uh, arrested dropped from about 80,000 a year during Trump's term to about 35,000 a year under Biden. And so that also accounts for some of this difference. Now, it should be noted that uh, deportations under Trump were lower, not higher, than the rate of annual deportations under uh, the Obama administration, uh, in which Joe Biden served as vice president. Okay, so let's now take a broader look, broader view of immigration by looking at its many effects on the U.S. economy. We all know the common costs of immigration. Many argue that an increase in immigration initially lowers wages of competing of workers that are competing in the same industry that new migrants might settle in. This is due to an increase in the supply of labor, often willing to work for lower wages. And so new, new labor entry increases competition in unskilled labor markets, which can drive down the wages. However, some studies show that even this effect lessens over time as native born workers adapt to new conditions and moved to more, more lucrative jobs and professions in the United States. Secondly, waves of immigration can lead to increased demand for public services, taxing governments and infrastructure in local communities. This is on display in the fallout following a surge of migrants into large cities such as New York City and Denver. Their mayors are complaining to the administration saying that they don't have the funding resources to handle this influx of migrants and demanding that the administration do more. What is less commonly acknowledged, particularly in the current highly charged political climate, is how immigration can spur and stimulate economic growth. Arguably, immigration has long been one of the major forces fueling the strong economic performance of the United States. So how does it do this? How does immigration help fuel economic growth? The first thing it does is it increases the supply of labor which then, he'll, then helps to fill gaps in labor markets. So immigrants often work the jobs that native-born workers refuse to take. And this can then reduce the costs of hiring and retention for industries that are employing unskilled labor. Immigrants also tend to be more willing to move long distances to where jobs are located, relieving geographic labor shortages. And again, this influx of labor reduced production costs for these industries, which can then pass on lower costs to their consumers. Immigrants also fuel economic growth because they spend their wages in the local economy, which increases consumer demand locally and the local tax base. This in turn can then help to create more jobs. Finally, immigration infuses the economy with talented and driven individuals which can then create dynamic gains which are associated with new innovation and productivity gains that make workers more efficient in what they are making. A 2022 study found that 55% of the founders of billion dollar companies in the United States had at least one founder who was an immigrant. One can see the positive economic Im impact of immigration in the United States looking at the economic recovery after COVID. A combination of restrictions on immigration enacted by the Trump administration and a sharp drop in international migration in general due to COVID-19 border closures led to a much tighter U.S. labor market right at the time that the U.S. economy started to reopen after the pandemic. The reopening of borders in 2022 and the easing of immigration policies under the Biden administration brought a sizable immigration rebound into the United States. 
This resurgence of immigration in turn helped alleviate the shortage of workers right when the U.S. economy most needed more workers, particularly in lower wage service industries like restaurants and hotels. By the middle of 2022, the foreign born labor force had grown so fast that it closed the labor force gap created by the pandemic, allowing industries to reopen more quickly and helping to control inflation by keeping wages down or holding wage growth down. In addition, immigrant workers were also much faster than native born workers to return to the work after the pandemic. It was migrant labor that filled the gap when native born workers were unwilling to return to work due to fear of infection, burnout or childcare concerns. Many economists argue that the surge in employment of immigrants was ultimately key to solving unprecedented gaps in the economy that threatened the country's ability to recover from prolonged shutdowns. As a senior economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas told the Washington Post, of post-pandemic American economic growth. You can't grow like this with just the native workforce. It's not possible. Again, this is a senior economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas saying there's no way that the U.S. continues to sustain economic, the post-pandemic economic growth without migrant labor. It doesn't happen without migrant right. labor. And, and there's like broader um, issues here as, as you know, developed countries have demographic problems. They're either getting older, they're, people are having less children. Immigration is the primary way to make up for those deficits as well. Um, China, which has, is facing these problems and, and lacks the kind of robust immigration that the United States has, is, is, is in a harder, is, is in for a rougher time dealing with those kinds of mass, you know, broad changes than a United States that that has higher immigration. So keep in mind this, these economic effects, especially as we start talking about at the end of this INN, the differences in the plans for restricting immigration between Biden and Trump, because there is a potentially drastic uh, implications if you dramatically shrink immigration, especially suddenly, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, it's important to keep in mind. Now, let's return to the issue of immigration's impact on the 2024 election. And we're going to start with an audio clip here from the New York uh, Times, the daily podcast, see, podcast guy. Um, and this one is from 2023, and it discusses um, that surge that we mentioned a couple times of immigrants into large democratically governed cities like New York um, that transformed the politics of immigration, uh, particularly within the Democratic Party. And so let's uh, run that clip now. So for the first time, the governor of New York, and she's a Democrat, a proud Democrat, came out and was putting the blame pretty squarely at the feet of the White House and President Biden, saying, we need your help. You got to step up here. That's why today I have sent a letter to President Biden formally requesting immediate executive action. And, and as if she hadn't been clear enough, the governor then puts out a press release actually naming President Biden, pointing the finger at him explicitly. It is past time for President Biden to take action and provide New York with the aid needed to continue managing the ongoing crisis. So she's naming names, and the name she's naming is the Democratic president of the United States, which means this isn't quite the normal course of events. A Democratic governor from a very Democratic state directly critiquing in public her Democratic president. Yeah, you're totally right, Michael. And it's even more striking because the governor had been very careful to take a more conciliatory approach to Washington as New York has been dealing with this crisis. She's been trying to talk to the White House regularly, which has been a pretty stark contrast to Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, and her counterpart as kind of the big Democratic leader in New York. This is one of the largest humanitarian crises that this city has ever experienced. Who for months now has just been slugging at the White House. Instead of standing on the steps of City Hall, we should be standing on the steps of the White House. Day after day, week after week, demanding more help. And asking the national government, what are you doing to the city of New York? And saying basically President Biden is leaving New York high and dry. The president 
and the White House has failed New York City on this issue. Now you also have the governor joining him in saying that. And in the last couple of weeks, as I've been reporting across the state, I've seen that sentiment spreading like wildfire among Democratic congressional candidates that I've talked to, particularly those running in House seats in the suburbs surrounding New York City. Remember, just a year ago, Republicans helped win their House majority by sweeping through a series of suburban swing districts around New York City and elsewhere in the state Democrats had held for a long time. Now these these Democratic candidates that are trying to win these seats back, who see a path back to the majority, but only through New York, are concerned that this issue, the arrival of 100,000 asylum seekers and counting here in New York City, and all of the fallout from it, is going to become another super potent political issue that may once again cost them these key seats and with it control of the House of Representatives. All right. So the first thing to note here is the change within the Democratic Party. Uh, Immigration and particularly um, the arrival of the immigration crisis into these big cities like New York really changed the rhetoric and the positions of Democratic um, politicians. Right? And it caused some divisions within the Democratic Party. And I think those divisions right now aren't um, really um, that apparent, uh, th- but I do think that they uh, will become uh, of greater importance as the campaign in 2024 really starts to heat up. Right? Um, the, there's a part of the Democratic Party, um, the moderate wing, if you will, that um, is now kind of leaning into this idea that immigration could be a democratic issue that it, um, could persuade voters to vote for the Democratic Party because of pragmatic problem-solving approach to the border crisis. And this was spawned, arguably, from these crises in New York City, in Denver, in in other big cities that were calling on the Biden administration to do something. And now the Biden administration has shifted, arguably, to the right on immigration um, and adopting some of the very policies that um, were the hallmark of a Republican approach that tried to restrict um, entrance uh, for migrants, tried to restrict the use of asylum um, and various other policies. And um, in doing so, uh, Biden is, is responding to uh, public opinion, but also calls from other members of his party who are facing these problems and and demanding that the Biden administration do something, right? And this is going to have electoral implications, particularly for uh, congressional seats. And in particular, I would say, for House seats. There is now this emerging um, debate, if you will, about how the Democratic Party is going to field candidates and, um, you know, strategize its uh, campaign message, particularly in moderate and suburban seats for the House of Representatives that might determine who ultimately controls the House. Because the Republicans have such a uh, slim majority, if they could swing a few seats, the Democrats could retake the House, and that would be a huge victory for uh, the Democratic Party. in 2024, but how do they do that? Uh, one thing that sort of emerged in a by-election uh, after the removal of George Santos, everybody remembers George Santos, uh, this Republican House member uh, from the New York City area who lied about everything. He eventually got kicked out of the House of Representatives and then they held another election uh, uh, and the uh, Democrat, uh, Tom Swazi, Swazi won uh, election. And, and he was a, uh, a pretty well-known figure in uh, the, the race and, and had a long um, political career there. And he won um, portraying himself as a moderate 
who uh, took a pragmatic view on uh, immigration and border security issues and really uh, argued that something needs to be done, more restrictions need to be applied. He, and he even sort of distanced himself from uh, his own party and from Biden saying that um, the Biden administration is, is, ha has made some mistakes on uh, managing the border and that he would fight for um, a different sort of approach. And so this um, immigration issue might change the way that the Democratic Party is approaching its election. And so um, we're coming to the end here, and, and what we're going to do here at the end of this, uh, seg this INN segment is to talk about the different policy programs on immigration offered by the two presidential candidates, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And these were uh, really easy to see in this, uh, you know, split screen visit to the border uh, yesterday, right? Um, what you can see from the Biden um, candidacy in, in its campaign is that Joe Biden has now embraced a, what he would probably call a more pragmatic uh, approach to uh, the border. He has embraced more restrictions um, to uh, deter uh, waves of migrants from coming to the border in the first place and to uh, restrict those migrants and, and, and turn them back if necessary, if it gets um, too overwhelming. Uh, this is a change for Biden. And it must be noted that originally, when Biden ran for president in 2020, he used uh, immigration as an issue. But in, at that time, in reacting to uh, the Trump administration's very restrictive policies, he promised a more humane approach to this issue. And in doing so, um, he rolled back some of the uh, restrictive policies and uh, that the Trump administration had in place, not those very same restrictions he is now, um, not all of them, of course, but um, some of them he's now embracing. And so when you look at the Biden administration, I'd say the best description of what he proposes in the approach to the border is that bipartisan um, deal that was uh, negotiated in the Senate but failed that provided uh, the president with um, more powers to shut down the border if there's um, too many uh, people trying to uh, cross, to try to manage the uh, flow of migrants across borders, to um, add additional restrictions on asylum, to reduce the use of humanitarian parole, um, which would be a real reversal for him, um, all trying to uh, solve the immediate crisis um, at the border, which is too many people trying um, uh, to cross uh, at this particular time. Uh, Biden has hinted even um, in the last week or so that he's contemplating executive action um, along these lines to achieve some of the goals that the um, deal that he uh, tried to pass with, um, uh, with Congress uh, was trying to uh, achieve. And so uh, this executive action would deny, uh, according to some, um, it hasn't been announced yet, would deny asylum to anyone who illegally crosses the border. And if that were um, put into place, then the logic would be that uh, uh, fewer people would try to cross knowing that if they did cross illegally and were apprehended, then they could, they could not um, apply for asylum and harming their chances of entering the, the country more aggressively. So, so let's as for, turn to Trump. All right, so as for Donald Trump, a New York Times story based on interviews with high-level Trump advisors, specifically Stephen Miller, who conceived many of Trump's immigration policies during his first term as president, argues that Trump has plans for a dramatic transformation 
of U.S. immigration policies if he's reelected. First, Trump plans to reinstate programs from his first term. These include a return of some version of the Muslim travel ban that prevented entry by people from certain Muslim-majority nations, a reintroduction of Title 42 that prevented immigration to prevent a health crisis, but this time the threat would not be COVID, but other infectious diseases like tuberculosis. Trump would also reestablish the Remain in Mexico plan, which is an agreement with Mexico that asylum seekers remain there while their claims are processed. Stephen Miller claims that Trump would also try again to end DACA, the Obama-era program that shields migrants who were brought to the United States as children from deportation and grants them work permits. Advisors also claim a second Trump term would include the largest, quote, sorry, would include, quote, the largest deportation operation this country has ever seen, unquote, that aims to deport over a million migrants per year. Ms. Pauser, a million. When we looked at the trends, under the Trump administration, a year, they deported 36,000. Yeah. Under Biden, it's 18,000. Even 80, at 80, 80, 80, sorry, yeah. sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, you're right. Anyway, um, a lot less. Than a lot less. We're talking, <laughs> yeah, right, much at, smaller factors. Yeah, now 80,000 versus 36,000. Yeah. And now you're talking about, you know, multiple times. I mean, I mean this, yeah. is, this, is a, this would be a huge change and a we can have a separate conversation about the humanitarian consequences of yeah, this yeah. but let's talk solely about it in terms of economic consequences this would be a massive contraction in the labor force and in the economy and if you're talking about numbers like that pulling four million workers out of the economy like that over a four-year turn um, I don't know how you do that without imposing a recession but right. anyway well, um, whole industries would just collapse yeah Right. Advisors also claim a second Trump term would include, oh, sorry, that, we got yeah. that, and then what was Over it? Over a million migrants per year. And yes. Then, now and how, are, how would they even logistically do that? And so one planned step um, to overcome the legal hurdles would be to significantly expand a form of fast-track deportations known as expedited removal that denies undocumented immigrants the usual hearings and opportunity to file So appeals. that's the legal problem and the humanitarian problem. Yeah. I mean, you just... Um, changing the rules. So this mass deportation effort would involve not only immigration and border agents, but also other federal law enforcement agencies and state National Guard troops and local police officers who would be deputized for immigration control efforts. Which, that's complicated too. Yeah. Now, there's also um, some talk about a building of huge camps to house all of these people who are arrested and eventually deported, yeah. well, which is a Terrible, but, but think about the implication of the deputizing yeah. state national guard troops to enforce. Uh, the, uh, the the governor of Texas is currently fighting efforts to do such so yeah. to do so by anyway. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> um, finally, Donald Trump has said he would issue an executive order on the first day of a second Trump term in office that would effectively end birthright citizenship, in which any person who is born with the United States is granted citizenship. This order would require that at least one parent be an American citizen or a lawful permanent resident for their children to become automatic citizens. Um, this is on the web page of the Trump campaign. And just so we're so clear, that official. would violate um, the Constitution. Constitution. It's, yeah. um, and birthright citizenship was a settlement clause to the Civil War designed to protect exactly. slaves, former slaves, and to ensure that they had citizenship yeah. in the United States in a post-slavery era. Now, one, one should take all of this with a grain of salt, right, in terms of, like, what would happen or potentially happen. There's a lot of obstacles to any of these um, actions. Um, if he doesn't have um, a Congress that's going to cooperate, Congress would block it, there's going to be obstacles in courts, there will be, you know, lawsuits just like there was the first time in, in his first term, uh, legal challenges really hampered his efforts um, on a variety of fronts. But um, this is, this I'd say this laundry list kind of um, shows a, a big difference, right? Yeah. There's, there's uh, Biden and his, he has shifted to the right and, and um, there will be a real attempt to restrict immigration, 
but he's not going to do mass deportations of a million people a year or anything close to that. So that's really the big difference. Well, and, and I think to that Biden has shifted to the right because Democratic voters have shifted, shifted to, to the, to the right. 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 He right. is responding arguably late to a movement in in the Democratic base and to a shift, a broader shift in U.S. public opinion. I think um, in the last four or five years, in that there is more support for more restrictions on immigration broadly mm -hmm. across the United States. If we're just aggregating and counting the number of voters that support this, that aggregate number has increased over the last five years. Right. And Biden has been slow to respond to that adjustment. Definitely. And, and it has taken, in part, pressure from local st and mayors and state officials with pressure on the administration to, to reorient um, policy. But I think the final thing that I want to say about this is we are in this equilibrium. It's an incredibly frustrating equilibrium from a policy effective stand standpoint, at least from the way I come at this. The equilibrium is both sides are going to use this issue as conflict to try and win an election in right. 2024. And, and they now have two different assessments about the consequences of any policy change. Right. So the Republicans think that their best move right now is to block this no matter what so they can hang failure on the Democratic administration and then hope to revise policy if they win. Right they believe that they're, they're going to win. Right. And the Democrat and, and so you have these. And so they get value in a sense, political value from not solving the issue over the now. next 10 months, but using the issue as a device to mobilize their coalition to try and win and then impose the policies that they want afterwards. And that's basically their promise. Just wait. You'll get a better deal yeah. after the election. Yeah. And, right. and we should note that there are different assessments within the Republican Party about the wisdom of this. Right. So we had moderates in the Senate, in particular Mitch McConnell, right. who wanted to take the immigration deal on the table because the arguably result. he knew that the, the probability of running the table in the elections in November wasn't as good as Trump's team suspects, and he doesn't know if that deal is going to be on the table. Right. If the Democrats hold the White House, the House, or the Senate, Republicans get nothing right. like what was on the table in the last month. Right. And McConnell knew that. So they've just decided to disagree and wait and see who wins the election. The problem is that we have a majority of U.S. voters that say we need some time, we need to address this. I think, right? And politicians are just saying, "Well, we're going to wait. We're ten months, and yeah, so that's where we're at. We're kind of stuck in an equilibrium of of inaction and rhetorical claims, and we have to wait until January to see what happens." Right. So, all right, that's it for today. Um, perhaps we'll be returning to this issue again. We've got two more news segments left. If you have any questions, reach out to us. Otherwise, have a good week.